hello uh, good morning to all of you uh, here uh, so this tutorial 11 is uh, an exciting real life ex application I, i would call this uh, uh, taking deep learning from the lab to uh, uh, a geological application so we have a, a great team uh, from shell uh, who will be presenting this uh, this tutorial so uh, this is about uh, deep learning for seismic uh, image processing uh, workflow so that's that's what it is about so the team uh, consists of so just a minute so the team consists of uh, can we have uh, each of you like uh, just showing your video please uh, it's uh, aniruddha panda subhashish banerji sarv Chaudhary and uh, Pandu Devrakota. So this is the team. Uh, so can we have all of all of the presenters just uh, turning on their cameras for a few seconds, maybe? Uh, Subhashis, if you can just uh, turn your screen share off, and then we just see the. Okay. Thank you. Pandu, yeah. Pandu is not here. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. So this is the team, and uh, so I'll just uh, give it over to the presenters now, uh, and I look forward to this exciting tutorial. Thank you. Thanks, Ramnathan. So we can start now. Absolutely yes. Uh, for okay. the uh, for the audience, what I would want to say is, if you may have questions, uh, uh, I give the choice to the presenters as as to whether they want to take the questions at the end of the tutorial or. Maybe uh, in an interval of every twenty minutes or so, so uh, the, the presenters can decide for themselves about that. Uh, whatever questions you might have, there is a Q and A. Uh, uh, there's a Q and A tab where you can just type in your questions. There's also a chat tab, but uh, for ease of uh, uh, compiling the questions, it's it's better that you kind of uh, list your questions in the Q and A tab. So that's what I wanted to say. So over to you, uh, presenters. Thank you. Thanks, Ramnathan, and thanks the organizer to give us the opportunity to present our uh, work, understanding about uh, how the seismic processing is taken it to the deployment, and what are those performance issues that often uh, an engineer, the performance engineer, faces during uh, deployment of any of this uh, seismic processing workload. So traditionally. Seismic processing has been there for decades, and if you look at the current trend, where we are seeing that uh, more and more uh, automation and AI-specific applications are coming into the picture, where uh, the analysis is getting augmented with the findings of uh, the the subsurface images, and geologists are also uh, getting their uh, the the image processing task. Uh, faster, right? So in this context, uh, we wanted to show you that some of these uh, real-life application scenarios, where uh, it is just not the algorithms that makes the difference. It is also very important to find out uh, the bottlenecks when you take an application to the deployment and how to remove those bottleneck and make your code or make your deployment more performant. So typically. Uh, Uh, when when geologists take these applications and they deploy it on their system, so they need the responses much faster, right? And so that you can process much more data. And performance is one of those important parameters that they just cannot avoid. So, giving that context, I uh, I'll now ask Anirudha to uh, go ahead with uh, with the with the the presentation. So we'll split the presentation into two main parts. The first part will talk about a very high-level uh, analysis of how the seismic processing is being done and what are the performance challenges, which are, uh, uh, I mean, taken care of. And in the second part, we'll show some of the hands-on uh, demonstration and walk you through the codes that we developed and how to optimize those codes in, in the context of uh, this particular application. So uh, let me know if you can see my screen.
now yes okay anirudha please go ahead yeah thanks thanks soshish and uh, yeah we, uh, so this is uh, this is basically a compliance thing from the shell side so this just uh, a tldr version of this is that please don't take any uh, financial decisions based on the content of this slide that we are going to present so that's essentially uh, our company mandates us to show this and uh, yeah so the agenda for this particular uh, tutorial is a brief introduction to seismic processing and uh, a role of ai in it so i, I think uh, as i move forward i'll give a very brief overview of um, seismic processing so uh, we would also like to acknowledge a few folks within shell who, who have been part of uh, this particular uh, code base or this particular application that we are going to uh, share with you um in the hands on tutorial next slide please yeah so seismic processing in a nutshell is basically just giving you a bird's eye view of what what it is all about so as uh, we were discussing in the backstage that um, how does shell is is attending this particular conference which is a computer oriented uh, conference and I, i would just like to take a very high level overview of what 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 is the relevance um, of seismic processing how does this this then uh, cascade down to deep learning applications and compute applications uh, that uh, we would be seeing uh, just for your information seismic processing is is the main uh, workhorse of all the hpc consumption in shell so it's uh, it amounts to almost 85% of all the compute cycles that shell has is is getting spent on seismic processing so that's how huge how important how instrumental seismic processing is to shell um so seismic processing basically uh, is uh, just a fancy word of saying uh, an ultra sound of subsurface so just when uh, you have some problems uh, where somebody cannot use a destructive method of testing or diagnosing what is happening inside your body um, they use sound waves to basically see what is what is happening the same thing goes for the uh, earth or the subsurface that we that we uh, say here so generally what what is shown here is there is a marine um, uh, marine seismic acquisition process that is being shown here where you have a seismic survey vessels uh, with lot of source and uh, receivers which are uh, which are arranged in a very uh, in a grid like manner and the source basically what they do is uh, they inject uh sound just like sonar and um, the receivers basically uh, receive it that's your signal that that then converts that then gets converted into the picture that is shown below um if uh, subhashish so can move the cursor bit down so yeah this one so uh, as you can see the boat is moving um, it, it essentially is a wave equation and that you are trying to solve so wave equation uh, defines how a wave propagates in a media um what you receive on the receiver is a time um or let's say a temporal uh, profile of the signal that is getting received now you have to convert that into a depth uh, domain so so let's say a a, a signal that receives from uh, these reflection zones that are shown in red these are areas of interest these these may be faults these may be uh, cracks in the surface there or maybe these are these are geological patterns which a geologist is looking and uh, placing its bet on uh, an oil reservoir being there so an oil reserve reservoir comes with certain sort of geological formations and it is the, this signal that that gives you uh, let's say a probabilistic uh, uh, probabilistic uh, bet on where to drill that's essentially how i would place it uh, or i would say it in a very commercial sense so that's why how uh, that's why the seismic processing is important so a normal when you uh, when you collect the seismic uh, volumes or acquire the seismic images uh, there is a lot of processing that happens to convert this time domain information into the depth domain information that you see so the depth domain information that you see is a map of reflectivities Uh, how sound is reflecting from different layers within the earth surface um so as you can see uh, on the left hand side um, a normal seismic processing workflow uh, comprises of data preparation short processing 
data preparation is basically now the data is there on a ship or maybe some data warehouse you you get it to an hpc system in the right way uh, right way format suited for the software to process it then these raw shots are basically um, are very noisy so you you apply some sort of signal processing uh, algorithms on top of it and uh, do a noise prediction but when you do a noise prediction and remove those no noises you also quantify what is the uncertainty uh, in in these algo or uncertainties that is being manifested due to these algorithms so uq and qc uh, also become part of this this workflow and then you essentially get a denoised shots so uh, the blue block that you see comes uh, later down in the seismic processing workflow which is the velocity model building and that is essentially based uh, saying that okay let's say if i have a, a granite media um, the the velocity of sound is different if there is a water surf if there is a water body the velocity of sound is different now uh, this is all this is all documented in literature which media has what velocities but the reality is a is a very heterogeneous mix of different medias and these are not characterizable as a pure water media or a pure granite media these might be having uh, undulations of different other uh, things that are coming in so you basically come up with a velocity model as to say um, in which let's say voxels of this data that you collected what velocity of sound would you like to go ahead with so that whole um, uh, process of getting the right velocity model is very very crucial to convert the time domain to depth domain because that's very very essential for solving your uh, wave equation uh, the light green color block that you see final migration um, final migration is basically then uh, basically solving the uh, the wave equation and uh, getting the uh, getting the reflectivity map out of it and re uh, reporting it and archiving it so if we go next uh, it's coming up on my side uh, it's a bit hazy i'm not sure that is the case with yeah no it's fine so uh, this particular um, tutorial focuses on salt bodies and the question then up, then applies like why detection of salt body so salt bodies have been always characterized in the literature or in geological literature as to always having some sort of a hydrocarbon trap around them and that's that's your one very big um, probabilistic jump of saying that uh, you know if you can find a salt dome in the right shape or form which which maps with what the domain knowledge of a geologist uh, tells then there is a high probability that it is also surrounded with oil formations around it and then of course the question is that uh, what's the size of the dome uh, how much of an oil reservoir cap is forming around it and whether it's a economically viable scenario to drill and get oil from there so that that's different part of the puzzles but salt bodies are often highly correlated and often highly associated with hydrocarbon trap zones and that's why detection of the salt bodies are very very important uh, second is okay processing and inferring time is con consuming so normally when these salt bodies uh, are to be detected previously uh, a human seismic processor or uh, a geologist used to look at these reflectivity maps and annotate the regions where uh, salt bodies um, or he or she feels that that a salt body is is, is uh, visible or uh, there is a chance of salt body presenting here and that is basically a human driven approach and it as you can see in the previous time time frame the whole seismic processing to process just one shot of a region uh, can take months to get the right image of the subsurface so uh, here what we are trying to do is uh, how how do we aid or replace uh i would not say replace it is there is still a human element that comes at the end to uh, really see uh, the results coming out of a uh, data based workflow such as deep learning uh, but basically it it minimizes the human intervention to a great level and thus also accelerates the salt detection pipeline um, in in this particular case and this is a perfect case for ai to help uh, because there is there is there has been lots and lots of uh, such seismic volumes where the uh, subsurface map is also present and where the annotations of salt body or salt 
boundaries are also present so it's it's it gives you a good leeway to already sit on a lot of label data that that has been shown in the uh, literature that computer vision uh, specifically in case of supervised uh, deep learning is is very is very dependable and uh, gives you uh, quite correct answers so that's basically the premise on which we proceed uh, on on the salt bodies deep learning aspect uh, as we move ahead next slide yeah so uh, basically in this particular workflow of deep learning convolutional neural networks uh, i mean it's it's just one class of um, uh, deep learning methodology that has been applied uh, for salt detection for faces classification and things like that uh, but there are uh, in the literature there are other aspects also which which or other uh, deep learning or database uh, computer vision technologies out there which can also be applied and some of them are listed here like classification regression networks or uh, generative adversarial networks that you can you can create some sort of a uh, label data set on also uh, then plug it in in terms of a, in, in, with a convolutional neural network to have a pure GAN kind of approach of lately encoded uh, decoder networks have also um, been uh, prevalent and uh, one of the example of this playing out pretty well was in a kaggle challenge called as tgs salt challenge which you guys can also look look at if you just uh, search kaggle tgs salt challenge so there you can also see a lot of different approaches that people have taken uh, pure convolutional and uh, encoder decoder but i think one of the top performers in, in the leaderboard was an encoder decoder based uh, architecture uh, that gave better results. And then of course you have like uh, hybrid networks where, where physics information has also been some, some sort of, you know, included to give a hybrid data and physics based um, prediction of a salt boundary. So this is just to kind of scope out uh, what's what's there in the space uh, when when we talk about seismic phases classification or seismic uh, salt classification uh, kind of problems. Next slide, please. Uh, still, it's coming up. Okay, yeah. So key learnings, what have been from our previous work? Supervise, as I said, supervised learning using encoder decoder are good in detection, detecting object boundaries. And that's something that uh, the literature out there says us. And also, as I said, uh, Kaggle challenge was a, was a real test where people demonstrated it with uh, a real data set. CNN architectures can um, identify and segment geological bodies, and that's something which is of no surprise, uh, at least in other uh, semantic segmentation or object detection kind of problems. But this is this is where we kind of uh, uh, bring along a very mature uh, data-based uh, architecture in, um, into seismic processing and see how how good or how worse it performs, and. Uh, yeah this is just this has been just uh, let's say some some learnings that we have uh, we have seen all through this while and the summary of this particular slide is that uh, uh, that we went with a convolutional neural network based uh, architecture um, basically a very well documented and um, well applied into other tasks called as unit and that is something on which we built to be built upon to detect the salt boundaries uh, in seismic uh, volumes that we acquire. Next slide, please. Yeah, the workflow that we we currently run uh, looks uh, something like this, and uh, let's say due to some proprietary nature of uh, of uh, of the workflow that we have devised, uh, we have kind of masked out uh, some specific details around it, but a very high level overview of how this particular workflow works is you import seismic data, you run uh, salt detection workflow on it, on it, on top of it, you generate what, what are known as salt bags. And uh, there is of course model validation and then you run uh, migration on top of it. Now, uh, easier said than done. And the salt detection workflow in orange is is probably 
looking uh, a very simple workflow where you just uh, plug in or put in your seismic 3d volume and you'll get salt detection uh, volumes but and no it is not so so uh, there are different workflows different constituent workflows to get get this all right uh, as you can see in in one of the workflows that we have uh, we have shown here which is the top salt just detecting the top boundary of of the uh, of the salt you need to run four different consecutive um, convolutional neural network models to get the prediction of the top boundary right uh, and similarly there are four different workflows the top salt is one workflow which is or a salt back comes with a characterized char very characteristic top salt then there is something called as bottom salt then there is something called as top salt overhang and there is also something called as bottom salt overhang so these four different workflows which are constituent of that orange box uh, the uh, salt detection workflow are geared towards detecting one thing right which is getting the one characteristic right and then there is some post processing that happens at the very late uh, end to create a salt bag in a complete sense as to how how do you plug these four different boundaries to get a picturization of the salt bags um next slide yeah so uh, with this uh, this is probably uh, uh, what uh, we had in mind to just kind of bring you from uh, uh, from a shell perspective of being an oil company to slowly get you down to something where data science comes in and uh, i think i have sufficiently given you a, a very high level overview of what the data science problem that we are trying to solve and then of course uh, we come with a performance engineer's view that probably Subhashish would uh, pick up from here and uh, take you through what are the different challenges in accelerating or uh, seeing what the performance bottlenecks of such a solution can be. Uh, with that, I hand over to Subhashish. Yeah. Thanks, Anirudh. So at this moment, uh, we can pause for a moment and see if there is any question. Uh, by the way, the, I mean, uh, so we will be having a hands-on session where I think uh, some part of this puzzle or at least our thought process of how we take an application and uh, look for performance bottlenecks, we'll take you through that. And I think uh, we already circulated something around it uh, for you to let us know what your email IDs are so that we can uh, we can send you the invites. So just in case if you didn't have time to respond to it, you can uh, do it over the chat window. We have only 30 VMs uh, for the hands-on session. So, uh, I mean, first come, first serve basis. So we already have created the accounts for those who have responded and there are a few slots still remaining. Yeah. Okay, so, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll shift the context here a bit. So uh, what Aniruddha was talking about, looking at, uh, the seismic data and process it to find out that how the salt bodies are looking like. So what are those boundaries so that you can detect the salt body? Now, what he said is something from the algorithmic point of view. Now, it is not always guaranteed that if you if you take that existing algorithm and uh, push it into your workflow, it is going to work as expected. In most of the cases, uh, these algorithms, the way it is designed and it is implemented in the deployment scenario is not always optimal performance. So this is the responsibility of a performance engineer to make that algorithm work. It will definitely work given that you have unlimited amount of time, but that's not the case. So you have to have always a performance engineer's view where you, you should be always thinking that whether this particular algorithm is performing well or not. Now, given all those different types of applications so we understand that the performance is critical so yeah, performance is critical and where you can save time you are essentially saving the cost of everything so cost of deployment cost of analysis cost of uh, getting some of the inferences done and so on now in in most of the cases uh, software depends the uh, software performance depends on the underlying architecture right so you have traditional architecture, which is based on the servers, which are CPUs. And also for last 
several years, GPUs are also coming into the mainstream computation where you have a hybrid uh, kind of uh, or heterogeneous kind of application uh, which is running on this architecture. Now, given that uh, the CPU as well as the GPU scenarios, you cannot always say that uh, if I have a fast test machine, I would have performed very well, but that's not the case because if you look at the way the programs are designed and the program flow is uh, implemented, in, 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 in some of the scenarios, you can come up with a code which is, which is going to uh, I mean, make the GPU performing really bad. So think about a scenario where you are doing a lot of this decision making type of execution. If there are a lot of if then else. Now, in those kind of applications, you will see that the GPU performs really bad because GPU is not designed to do this kind of a logical operations. It is supposed to be doing mostly the floating point operation at its uh, peak, but it is not good at doing all these logical operations. On the contrary, if you look at the CPU application and you know that the floating point operation takes multiple cycles uh, to give out the data or get the results. Now, if you give a lot of floating point operations in your CPU uh, program, you will see that the CPU is going to perform or underperform and you will not achieve the theoretical performance. So typically, if you if you look at this, uh, this three uh, different domains, there's the development of uh, software, and uh, there is also an understanding of the underlying architecture, that is the system architecture, as well as the processor architecture. And there is a, a quality of uh, uh, assuring the quality of the software. So there is an overlapping area, and this is the area where a performance engineer works. So in this context, he has to understand that the diff different types of application. He also has to understand that what is the application running on the specific architecture. And also he has to guarantee that a certain level of performance is obtained from that application. Now, this is a, a typical scenario where a CPU GPU combination uh, system work. Uh, GPU acts as a slave device. So this is not having its own intelligence to find out that where exactly uh, it should offload the code to GPU and then uh, start ex executing the code from there. So it has to be told by the CPU, the master device, which, which decides that what are those points where it has to offload the code to the GPU so that uh, it gets the processing done and comes back with the data. And this is this is a, a flow of operation which happens typically inside a system where there is a GPU attached to it. So what you see here is that the first phase where the data is being copied to the GPU memory, and then GPU starts executing the operations, and then the processor or the CPU rather uh, instruct the GPU what are those operations that it should be doing, and then again copy back the data into the uh, host or the system. So typical GPU workload, it's always a combination of copy followed by a compute in GPU, and then again copy back to the host. Now, this, this operations of copying, compute, and copying back to the host is fairly straightforward, but in most of the cases, you would see that the rate at which you are copying the data and the rate at which you are consuming the data in the compute phase is not going to match. Now, in that case, you would see that there is a bottleneck that happens in the boundary of the data transfer and the compute. Now, this is the performance architect's job is to ensure that how this copy and compute can be overlapped such that if there is any bottleneck that can be hidden from the overall throughput of the system. So this is how uh, a high level, what it looks like a bottleneck. So here you can see uh, there are multiple lanes and think about a scenario where you have uh, four lanes highway where you are actually uh, driving at a cruising speed. 
Now, if you see that there is uh, a single lane which gets marched, all the four lanes gets marched into a single lane, and there is always a contention across the vehicle. So then this contention is actually limiting the overall throughput. And the same thing happens in most of this, uh, 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 this applications where there are different parts of the application is doing different tasks. And when they try to share data or start working uh, across different nodes, so that is where the contention starts in. And you see that there is a bottleneck so that you would not be able to utilize the capacity of your system. So there are four main areas uh, to look at. Uh, so the, the first area is where the compute is happening. That is the processor and code pipeline and all these things. And the second uh, source of bottleneck is in the memory. So you, you have a limited memory, you have a limited memory bandwidth. The rate at which you are reading and writing into the memory can be overlapped with multiple uh, processing nodes requesting the memory. And in that case, you will have a contention and you would be uh, eventually leading to one of the bottleneck problems. The, another uh, source of bottleneck is communication. Communication is across the nodes. When you are communicating across multiple nodes, you would always see that the bus through which the communication is being done is also occupied. And there is another source of bottleneck. And the fourth one is the, the IO operations that happens when you are writing a data or reading data from the disk or any other external devices. So these four things typically is taken care of when a performance architect looks at the workload and tries to find out where the bottleneck is and try to resolve those things. So here I would try to give a very high level view of how a performance story for CPU and GPU looks like. Right? So in the left hand side here, if you look at so a typical CPU can have, say, 64 core processors. And if you think about it is running at a 3 gigahertz clock, and it is taking two operands, that is, two source operand, which it is computing on at a time. And this is the, the typical um, the maximum memory traffic that it, it would consume to produce some data or some results. Because so here, the 64 is the number of core and uh, this is the three gigahertz clock at which it is running and four such uh, four bytes are taken at a time and there are two such uh, input data right so two into four bytes that's eight byte is processed per data point now typically the memory bandwidth is something around 200 gigabytes per second and if you take a ratio you would end up coming to something seven or eight uh, in this ratio. So what it means is that, so if you can access memory once, and then if you want it to have a sustained level of computation, you would not be accessing subsequent seven or eight operations to the memory. So if you have a total of eight operations to be done, in that there would be one memory operations and rest of them should be compute operations. Otherwise, if there are too many of those memory operations are getting overlapped, then you would end up having the contention in the memory bus. Now, this, if you look at any of these classical CPU based programs, this ratio is typically in the range of six to eight. And that is how you would see that the compute is still feasible uh, given that the CPU architecture in place. But the scenario is quite different in GPU. If you look at that, so we have for a GPU, there are 5,000 odd cores, and it is running at something around 1.5 gigahertz of clock. And in that particular scenario, you would see that the memory bandwidth ratio comes to around 68, so which is quite high, right? So in that case, what you are trying to see is that you would be accessing memory once, and then subsequent 67 or 68 operation would be related to the compute. Now, if this balance is not maintained, you will end up having the bottleneck. Now, one can think of that, what is this generally CPU is talking about? So if you look at, Typical time delay to, to get the result out of a CPU is of the order of few cycles. And there are only fewer number of cores. So CPU is designed in such a way that it is going to give you data where your delay, that is delay of operation is, uh, is of importance. But in case of a GPU, 
you would see that the individual pipeline or the individual processing node, though it takes longer time to process because there are a lot of those processing elements, the end to end, uh, the total number of uh, the operations that gets uh, that gets done in a given second is much more. So you can say that the GPU has uh, has a much much higher uh, throughput, which essentially tells you that the GPU is actually uh, looking at making the throughput more rather than the latency more. Each latency, each each operation may have more latency, but you will get much more number of data points getting processed in in a given cycle or in a given second. So at this point, uh, I would stop here. Sora will take it over. So he will go through what are those different uh, tools and methodologies through which we typically get to know that how the bottleneck is coming into picture and how to solve them. Sora. Uh, yeah, thanks, Sivati. So as uh, Sivati mentioned earlier, that the challenge is to keep your CPU as well as GPU like overall resources busy uh, to gain maximum performance. And uh, in this uh, respect, the performance and analysis, uh, they help. Basically, they provide uh, a view of places uh, where uh, most of the time uh, spent, is spent uh, for your code workflow. And there are two ways uh, to show the pattern, um, as uh, mentioned here. So one is the uh, trace view, and the other is profile view. In the uh, figure at the bottom, you see the uh, uh, trace. That's kind of a representation of what a trace view um, looks like. So basically, it shows uh, an event-based timeline of uh, different events, both start and uh, the end time of uh, different events, such as like a function call or um, an external library call or some like uh, code block of a loop. Whereas for a profile uh, view, which uh, is an example we shown in um, the top figure, it's uh, typically um, in a nested manner, it shows the time taken by uh, different uh, code blocks um, in your uh, code. And this shows us uh, directly where most of the time is spent. You can basically um, sort, sort and do all kinds of stuff, like percentage wise, where the most time is being spent. And to get these uh, profile or uh, test view, trace view, or, or generally called just to get the profile, uh, we make use of uh, we can make use of different profiling tools. Uh, they come. Uh, they typically require you to uh, do some instrumentation uh, before runtime, during compile time, or sometimes pre-compile time, depending on what tools you're using. And often, like if you compile in debug mode, it works better. Um, depends on the tool you're using. There are many uh, different uh, profiling tools from different vendors, uh, both uh, free, paid, open source. Uh, some of these are uh, listed here. And I think typically what uh, if you're using NVIDIA uh, GPUs and is the inside compute, uh, it's their latest offering. That's what uh, one would use. For NVProf, uh, you can also use something called NVProf, which was a precursor of uh, this insight. Next one, Okay. Yeah, so um, in basically, uh, if you want to maximize performance, you want to uh, you want to know where the bottleneck is happening. That's an important question, um, and what what exactly is preventing um, your code from using the uh, basically what exactly is preventing uh, your code from utilizing the resources to 100% ideally. And identifying bottleneck then becomes important uh, if you want to utilize maximum resources. So basically uh, a performance bottleneck can occur at any uh, level of the uh, computing pipeline. If it occurs at the compute level, basically that means that your compute capacity um, is saturated and uh, data is waiting in the memory uh, to be processed. And if you look at the profile, it will show that 100% uh, of your GPU or CPU, whatever you're using for compute is um, busy, but you're not able to bust the data 
for for the memory bandwidth this is uh, this means that memory is saturated uh, while uh, cpu or gpu is not uh, fully utilized and if it's a memory uh, latency bottleneck that means that uh, data cannot be accessed from memory fast enough for your uh, compute devices cpu or gpu to work on it and what exactly is the type of bottleneck is um, it it can be identified basically uh, with the help of the profiling tool you look at the uh, patterns um, in the profile or the trace view and try to identify okay uh, where is exactly uh, which one is not under utilized and that will be give you some idea and it's not really an exact science so it's a combination of uh, what you know and experience and same just to note that the same application can be um, at times uh, both um, more than like a combination of uh, within the bounds of this combination either compute bound memory bound or memory latency bound at uh, different times within the uh, life cycle of your program so that's uh, that's that's the kind of overview of the uh, performance uh, part and uh, next we'll move on to the hands on session references for you and uh, we'll look at uh, just an example of um, how we do the performance engineering i hope uh, that uh, those of you are interested in getting resources for the hands on session have already in overseas if you have not um uh, please if you have not just uh, directly message here uh, email so that we can assign uh, resources for the hands on part anirudh what do you yeah thanks so Uh, before moving to hands on any questions if you have for the part that subhashish and saurabh uh, covered uh, let us know before we jump into the hands on session okay. so i think we can start doing this hands on uh, session it will take probably a couple of minutes for us to set it up and mm -hmm. uh, meanwhile i wanted to know that uh, so the slides uh, so how how do we share the slides to the organizers or people who wanted to see this for future reference i think this we, the slide sharing right yeah yeah this we can do it after the uh, okay. because this this whole session is being recorded so okay. uh, pending your approval we can we can share the slides in the video later Okay, that sounds good. So I'll stop now. Uh, Anirudh will take it forward for the hands-on session, and he will uh, tell us the instructions through which the participant can log into the uh, cloud account and uh, start experimenting with what we wanted to share here. Okay, sure. Uh, let me share my screen. Here, yeah, let me know if you can see. The screen is up, and okay, just give me a second. So essentially, uh, you folks would have received something called as a Azure uh, um, account registration link, and you uh, would need to essentially log in into Microsoft using your any of the Microsoft account, maybe an Outlook or uh, Gmail. whatever it is i see that few folks have already registered uh, over the um, over yesterday so the the link to access this is you go to labs.azure.com and if you have the link you would have registered and that credential would work fine if you have not registered 
please ping your email id to either one of us uh, so that we can send an invite in the to the back end and you would be able to then register and sign in uh, and follow my steps from sign in onwards so if you click sign in uh, that's my personal account with which i'm signing in which is a microsoft account and once you are able to sign in after registration you would be able to see uh, just one uh, vm down here which is comad 2022 seismic uh, what you need to do is uh, you need to click on this to start the vm so it will take some time to start the VM um, as the machine is provisioned and um, is live, maybe just a couple of minutes. And instead of starting, it will say that it's running now. In case it takes uh, some time, I have another machine which I can show you, but I think it, it, normally in my experience, it takes just a couple of minutes. So while it starts up, I think I'll just show you what are the next steps. Uh, so here I have another machine which I have already started even before, I mean, just a few minutes before the session started. And once your machine starts, uh, this particular box, this particular icon, small icon, will get activated once it shows running, just like it, just like this is showing running. So if you click on that, you will see two options: connect via RDP and connect via SSL. Okay, so it's good that it, the machine itself it started. So I'll just stick around with the visuals that you will also see, so to keep the confusion minimum. So now this is running. You have to be patient enough to uh, for Azure to provision that machine because it's a it's a, a Volta hundred card based machine which are a bit uh, less in supply uh, as we speak. So it, it might take a few minutes uh, for this to be in the in the state of running. So once it is running, this button gets activated. You click on this, uh, click connect via SSH. So this is the first time I'm using this machine. So it will ask you ask me to create a password. The password which we are creating, or I would advise you to, you can choose definitely your password, but there is no way for me to help you if you forget your password. So it's just best that we stick with one password in this session. So the password that I'm sticking with is chords, chords command at the rate tutorial 11, which is this particular tutorial. And this is the password that uh, I would advise you all to use as well. So once you set the password, setting password, this might take several minutes. It, it says so, but it, it's just a matter of uh, and a few minutes. Uh, the password uh, is enabled. 
while it is enabled let me just show you so again the button gets this button gets activated you click connect via ssh it will show you some some string that you need to copy just just blindly i mean copy it so once you copy it you can use any of your uh, terminal apps that you have so i'll just close my terminal app so let's say i pick this particular terminal app and i believe most of you are uh, accustomed to doing ssh logins to the machine so this is the the string that i pasted so i'll just advise one more thing to add to here and uh, just give me a second since this machine is now uh, running i'll just copy this machine's credentials so i paste this one and the i'll just advise one thing to add which is this and maybe saurabh or uh, subhashish you can post this particular string that needs to be um, added to the already available string that Azure provides you, which is to forward the port number double eight double eight to your own machines double eight double eight. That's it. Uh, the reason uh, we are doing this is that we are, you, we will be showing a, a demo from a Jupyter notebook uh, that that uh, lies there. So, so that you can also play around with the code, you can also execute, you can also see what is happening. So once you enter this, if it's your first time, it will ask you to accept the uh, RSA ID because it's the first time I'm doing it. So it's now added and now it asks you for the password. So password, as I said, is chords comat at the rate Codes command at the rate tutorial 11, all in small. Sorry. Yeah, and uh, you are inside the machine now. Okay, so this particular machine um, is um, uh, a machine with one GPU card, which you can check by doing the command NVIDIA SMI. I mean, I'm I'm pretty sure that everyone get, get, everyone whose machine is running is the same uh, is of the same hardware that I'm showing. So I'm just demonstrating it for the purpose of uh, let's say FYI that this is a machine with one Tesla V100 card where we'll run some experiments, uh, GPU-based machine where we'll run some experiments. And this is <clears throat> a machine with around 110 GBs of uh, RAM and uh, six uh, threads uh, that it comes with. So it's a pretty good workstation in, in my opinion. Uh, so once you are inside the machine, what we'll do is we'll start the Jupyter notebook and if I, if you are in the home directory, uh, just you can instantiate Jupyter using this command Jupyter lab hyphen hyphen no browser. Hey Anirudh, uh, a request can you blow up the font size a bit? Is it fine now? I mean, no way to check. Uh, for me, but uh, I assume you'll look at the chat and uh, see if that's fine with other folks. Yeah, maybe just give it one more. Okay. okay. How is that? Okay, I hope that's fine. So there is a full screen option. Uh, if you can go full screen, then maybe the uh font size will be increased now it would have increased it or yeah. no i'm talking about the viewers uh, okay yeah so 
Yeah, I mean, you can increase your font screen or font size depending on the client, SSH client that you are using. For me, it was just pressing Control Shift Plus to increase the font size. In some in some clients uh, that are Windows based, you can press Control and uh, move your mouse wheel to also increase the font size. Or, uh, I mean, or you can just uh, maximize your screen to see what best you can achieve if you don't know all these shortcuts. So anyway, can you, uh, can, you, uh -huh. can, can you add a couple more email IDs to the lab? I just added uh, okay. Yudas and Vijay Lakshmi Vittal. I believe you have you would have also uh, sent the invites, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, so anyway, so once you start the Jupyter Lab from the home directory, no need to go anywhere else. You will just for the for the sake of simplicity, we'll just use Jupyter Lab now to uh, explore this a bit. So, I mean, copy this whole string. Now, if you, you remember, I had forwarded my double eight, uh, forwarded the VM's double eight double eight port to localhost double eight double eight port, which means now if I just copy this link, I'll be able to uh, access it on my system itself so if you press the button the jupyter lab instance should be running which is basically now accessing the vm that you had just provisioned on azure okay so this is let's say one big step where uh, uh, I'll, I'll take a pit stop to see if there are some issues people are facing with um, and uh, then with, with a couple of uh, minute break, we can just then start uh, from here. Okay, can, can you, uh, Anirudh, go back a little and just show the connection string again for some people? Um, it would, it would have taken time from starting okay. the VM. So. so once this particular thing is in running state, you press this particular button, take the connect via SSH. Do not need to memorize anything here. Just copy it. Uh, go to, let's say, a terminal. I'll, for, for the timing, I'll just open another terminal. Increase the form. So right now, I'm just pressing Control shift plus plus but do as you wish, which which applies to your client. Uh, then you paste the whole string here as it is. And just before the P, uh, the minus P, you add this extra argument called minus capital L, uh, forward the port 8888 to localhost 8888. Basically, this means that uh, the machine's 8888 port is now getting mapped to your uh, systems double eight double eight port. Uh, once this is there, you press enter. If it would be your first time when you are accessing the machine, it will ask you to add the fingerprint to your um, uh, to save that fingerprint onto your system. Just ensuring that you are uh, connecting to the right system. And once you are seeing this password prompt, you uh, you enter the password that you would have said. But I had advised to put codes command at the rate tutorial 11 as the password all in small uh, now it says that uh, could not request local forwarding because i have already uh, running a application which is now getting forwarded to double eight double eight so i cannot have two ssh logins all getting forwarded to the same port so this is just a, something that that is uh, not possible and that's why it complains me but if you're doing it for the first time if you're doing it only one instance you will not see any error and um, you should be inside the machine then let me see if there are any questions Uh, so there is a correction in this. It's 
just add minus l one more eight there and whatever that command then minus p dot 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 whatever azure tells you Password to connect via SSH, you would be uh, putting that password. The system asks you to put the password when you first time do the SSH login. Um, I would advise to use this password, but you are free to choose your own password and remember as well. So maybe Anirudha, we can start showing that uh, the the salt crawler. Uh, should we be starting with the matmal thing or directly? I mean, I think we can skip because we uh, don't have uh, much time now. Okay. Okay. So we can uh, skip that. So yeah. Um, so I think are there some are there some people who. Uh, have uh, have been able to access it and reach where uh, I am right now. If that is the case, I'll start from there. Uh, I see Amit responding a yes, which means he has the Jupyter notebook open in front of uh, him. At least that's that's the stage that I'm referring to. how to open the notebook okay so once you are inside the once you have logged in inside the um, terminal or you are inside the vm now so then on the terminal from the home directory itself you just press you just give this command no browser the jupyter uh, notebook Okay. So there I am, and this is what you'll see if you if you run it from the home folder. So uh, the first particular cell is just some for people for folks who probably are using Jupyter uh, Lab for the first time, uh, and uh, basically on the left hand side is is a, a directory explorer. So if you click on this particular folder icon, you will you will reach the home directory, believing that you st you started your Jupyter Lab from home directory. So if you click on this particular uh, button, you will see you will get to the home directory. And the directory of interest for us right now is Cords Combat 2022. And uh, we are skipping the CUDA simple CUDA uh, mat mat multiplication part and just uh, directly jumping into the salt inference client so if you open that salt inference client there is this one notebook called as salt salt in inference dot nb which is the notebook and if you double click that this thing will open up i believe it would have already opened up i mean the system has been set up like that so once you are on the jupyter lab um, interface you will be seeing this notebook already open for you so uh, left hand side is the is the uh, browser if you want to access a terminal you can also do it from here so if you click plus and go to terminal you can also get a terminal to the system within the jupyter lab interface as well so if it's the first time for you 
to use Jupyter Lab, this might be of interest. Otherwise, uh, you know, most of the folks who are right now uh, looking at uh, data science and computer science applications must be must have come come across the Jupyter uh, Lab ecosystem and the platform itself. So, yeah. So this particular uh, uh, tutorial uh, will focus on the inference server. So inference server uh, means that uh, there is a model that you have already trained and you are at the stage where you want to deploy it. Now, while you deploy it, uh, you, you are faced with two, let's say decision-making um, juncture, whether to go ahead with a simple uh, in inference script where the model is being uh, served from a, from a folder and you just, um, you know, do the, uh, do the call to that particular model to with some input data and you'll get the output data on the same system so this is a very simplistic model which is uh, which is doable and which is fine for simple experimental stuff or when you are uh, just doing some poc kind of stuff but when you want to deploy a model where uh, you don't know how many inference requests are going to be coming to your uh, coming to your model that is sitting on one particular location you basically uh, are looking into some sort of a server client architecture so client is basically a python script which will which will uh, send image data to a server and the server will process those images and pull in the required model and given the inference request back so right now in this particular um, uh, tutorial what we are demonstrating here is the nvidia's triton inference server so which is a very scalable uh, approach to deploy your deep learning model so you can also look at the link here and see what what the uh, capabilities of the system are i mean we are not uh, really advocating to use nvidia triton inference server but given that the system is a nvidia gpu based system and there is a solution out there which which, which can be repurposed for our use case uh, and a, a server client architecture really shines in such a scenario where you have different clients sending in different images image requests to a central server uh, this is basically a scalable approach to look at and that's what we have done in this particular uh, tutorial as well so the architecture of this system looks uh, so don't get uh, confused by the uh, nature of this particular diagram essentially client application is, is an application that act that accesses the server through either either of the two services called as the HTTP service or the gRPC services. These services are basically uh, getting uh, served on different port numbers. Uh, I'll come to that as we go ahead. And there is a model repository which contains all the trained models, trained models that you have already trained. So it can be, let's say 15 different models, 20 different models, 30 different models. It can be all models of different things it can be also different versions of the same model so then think of this as a model repository or a github code repository where uh, different uh, in different snapshots of your code or different snapshot of your model resides now what this triton inference server does is it does all the heavy lifting that once you send an image through an http uh, protocol or a grpc protocol it through a particular api of course it looks at the api it will it will check how many inferences are already running so there is already a scheduler inside so let's say if there are five images that are already getting processed and the gpu has the capacity to to take in one more it will take one more if it does not have the capacity it will put you in a queue so all these uh, mechanics or uh, the other aspects of it is is done by this particular um, offering of uh, triton inference server and once you have let's say a slot available in the scheduler picks that particular request then it asks the model management um, service to seek the model of interest and it can it supports all kind of uh, data science uh, libraries at this particular moment as we speak so tensorflow onyx pytorch um, and uh, you know uh, there is one more uh, offering from nvidia called tensorati which which can also save model in its native format so all these formats are accessible and readable and it then pings that particular model and sends the inference request back to the client that is what its job is 
So we are using this because this is, I, as I said, this is a scalable approach. So uh, moving ahead to the Docker aspect and why the Docker aspect is coming into picture here is because NVIDIA offers this offers this uh, Triton inference server in a Docker container. So basically, it's just a uh, primer on uh, what, what Docker is all about. If you want to go through it, uh, you can uh, go through it. And there is also resource links, which uh, which will also help you traverse what Docker is all about. But essentially, Docker is, is about containerizing your applications uh, such that they are portable. So right now, NVIDIA offers Triton inference server installed, already installed in a Docker container and sh it ships uh, Sorry, different versions of that container. And what we are going to do is we are going to just use that container as it is. So the container that we are interested in right now is a Triton inference server, uh, version 21.12, uh, developed on Python 3 uh, ecosystem. And this is available from a service that uh, NVIDIA provides. Um, called as nvidia ngc uh, nvidia gpu cloud so you can see that this container exists here and there is a pull tag here so if you copy if you copy this pull tag uh, it, it gets copied and essentially what gets copied is this command this is basically the command that gets copied um, so nvidia gpu cloud also has um, you know other containers as well that that are uh, ready to use um, triton being one of them and we are right now interested in this triton inference server uh, just uh, yeah so please note that the container has already been pulled in the template machines you have access to so uh, how do you know you already have pulled this container so i, I go into the terminal and I just do a docker image ls command. <coughs> so it, it shows that this container already exists in the system. This is what you should be able to see. Everybody gets a copy of the same machine. So there is no reason that you wouldn't see a different thing as long as you would execute the same command. So this is what you should be seeing that there is a 12 GB container that's already sitting there. Now, what we need to do is we need to run this inference server as a backend. So as I said, it's a server client architecture, server, um, server runs all this stuff and the client only accesses to these communication protocols, that's it. So just waiting to uh, check if there are any questions as of now. Yeah, I think Anirudha, we can proceed a little faster. Maybe we have around 10, 10 minutes time or so. Okay. Yeah, so essentially, yes, you, you, you execute this particular uh, line, running the Triton server executable with the Docker container. So what I'm doing here is a few things to note. I'm exposing the GPUs with the hyphen hyphen GPUs argument here. And of course, since I have just one GPU, I'm just exposing one GPU to the Docker container. What I'm doing is I'm, I'm mapping some ports. So port number 8000, 8001, and 8002, which are the default ports of Triton server are getting mapped to 9000, 9001, and 9002 on the host machine. Uh, this is because there are a few things already running on the 8000 port so that's why to avoid that conflict i'm i'm using this 9000 series of ports so, but you just need to remember that you need to you need to open those these uh, ports for the client to access the server uh, it's very essential because that that's your communication protocol the next thing that i've done here with the minus v command is basically to map the models uh, directory which is which is here uh, the salt water bottom model to a uh, slash models directory which will sit inside the container so and and like that there are few few other things that that is listed here which you can go and in the interest of time i'll just copy paste and 
uh, run this particular command and let you know what happens. So if you run this command, So at this stage, if someone wants to do the profile of uh, their uh, inference pipeline, so do they need to also invoke uh, the profiler inside this Docker container? Yes. Um, so that's uh, somewhere down here, uh, profiling the code section. So if you want to profile uh, the uh, in, uh, profile the inference server what is happening inside the inference server you need to execute this command followed by a few other commands so all steps are kind of written out here uh, for folks to look at should i directly now profile it you can try i mean maybe something that you can show them that how the profile is being done and how what are those important takeaways from the profile okay Okay, uh, so let's directly, um, instead of uh, incrementally explaining what are the different uh, things that, that is happening in, in the code, uh, let's, uh, let's run an end-to-end -end, uh, salt inference pipeline. I mean, end-to-end -end as in like, it's not still end-to-end. -end. We are just picking one particular uh, puzzle out of the complete workflow to show and demonstrate it here because of the IP-related issues. But um, that is a good uh, representative sample for you to get a taste of what we do uh, on a daily basis when we develop such large scale applications. Uh, so I'll just uh, close this one. Let me open another terminal. Let's directly go how you uh, how you would get a uh, profile out of this uh, this code. So server side profiling. So what you do here is that you will run Docker the same container. But remember now what I'm doing is minus it. So I'm now going in, I'm going interactively inside the container and will play play with some things. So the thing is still kind of running. Yeah, I think I killed it. Yes. So yeah, back to uh, the same line. So what we do right now here is that I did a Docker uh, command for interacting with the container so right now i'm inside the container you see okay so inside the container what you do is uh, you provide this particular command to launch ansys ansys is again a profiler and that is provided by nvidia so i know i'm a bit sounding more like an nvidia employee than a shell employee but <laughs> This uh, whole hardware ecosystem is of NVIDIA and the software stack is also of NVIDIA. So we are probably using quite a lot of NVIDIA technologies here uh, in, in showing what we are doing here. Yeah, I think going forward, uh, there will be Intel as well as AMD architectures out. And uh, the interface would be uh, very similar. So it takes a bit of time. It, it it runs few things. As you can see, it, it loads all the CUDA libraries that you see. 
and eventually you see that this model this one model which is sitting in the folder that i have pointed is ready for serving so now, right now it's waiting for inference request to come in and the server will basically uh, send back uh, the inference request so what i'm going to do is i'm going to put put this already running process in the in in the background with by pressing control z so that's still that's still running in the background and what i'm going to do is i'm now going to profile uh, start the profile as of now i hadn't started the profile because you see there was a huge time that took initially uh, to just to start the server so i don't want to play around with the time that that already it took to you know load so many libraries and that then coming up in my profile uh, data so what i'll do is i'll start the profiling now and it says the start has been executed now here you see that this is this is this is a a uh, file that sits there which has an end to end client application which basically takes in a seismic data it breaks it down uh, into uh, multiple tiles and then it sends this request over the grpc protocol to the server so what i'm going to do is once this in, this uh, uh, profiling has start has started on the server side i'll go to another terminal and Uh, if you're finding it difficult to follow all the instructions are are there in place here you can share the jupyter notebook with you folks to play around with it as well so once you go to another uh, tab you just need to uh, start the client application and the way how i want to start the client application is just give a python inference sample dot py this essentially starts the client application now while the client application starts it will communicate with the server and everything that that is happening here will get recorded in the in the profile report that gets generated i just want to let you see one uh, application that get started and you can of course also Uh, open another terminal to see uh, how is your gpu utilization with nvidia smi so you have stopped anirudh that the process right so that has to be started in the background no no that is in the background that is running in the background so it says stop but it is not stopped it's just in the background okay this is uh, this kind of bringing in some libraries in and uh, as you will see it will generate a random data set and uh, pass it through for inference and it will take some very around like 40 50 seconds or i guess 100 seconds because there is now an uh, profiling overload overhead so while this while this happens and uh, as you can see it, it it's now generating random seismic data it it is pinging the inference model called rand salt water bottom detection the model keras model file name is 2019827 salt water bottom as it correctly identified because this is what is getting served from the uh, this thing and as soon as you see there is a ping that this server received it also start spitting out some diagnostic messages but you can ignore and just wait for this to close while i show you an already uh, sampled uh, profile in my system that i have kept for demonstration so this is the this is the gui uh, front end that uh, nvidia provides to read these files the files are basically uh, are uh, with the extension qdrip so once you click and i am showing you an exact same um, code that we have we had profiled previously we can also see that this is still running we will check in a while when this ends and you will also see again a report that gets generated So this is how a profile looks like. 
give them a little bit of time. Yeah. So this is this is what the details of uh, of profiling, let's say, uh, tells you. So it, it tells you what are the different hardware architectures that that were uh, in use uh, while you are while you were sampling the uh, TRT side, and it also tells you what is what is happening on the CPU side of things. Now remember, I'm I'm now um, uh, profiling this on the server side server side, so you don't see much of the action happening on the CPU side because for the CPU side action, you have to now profile the the client application, not the server application. So right now, what we have done is we have profiled the uh, server application. This particular block that you see, as uh, Saurabh was mentioning, is basically all the GPU activity. I believe. Uh, I will just kind of just kind of magnify a bit. Is it visible, uh, Subhashish? Sort of now. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the blue ticks that you see is all the GPU activity that is happening, and you can see for the majority part there is there is a very high activity. So the height of the bar, it let's say a GPU is hundred percent occupied or. 100% being utilized and the and the ticks as they go down is is signal of a uh, let's say a less um, gpu utilization uh, to give you a very bird's eye overview of let's say when you're looking at the profile at a distance when you are deep diving into the profile of course you will see more details as i zoom in but this is the timeline view of when what things start and when what things are getting finished so let's say we go so if if you just zoom in with with your mouse you will see you can now see each and every kernels that that are uh, that are getting instantiated so i click the scuda hardware tesla 100 and you can now see which kernels are getting instantiated if you hover your mouse over one particular kernel, let's say, you will see some statistics around this kernel. So the statistic says that uh, it, it's a 128 cross 128 Vinograd, and it's coming from uh, CoDNN library. And uh, so this particular kernel is coming from CoDNN library, which is basically an implementation of the graph that you are trying to now execute. The graph is is the trained model that you that you have in that salt water bottom uh, there are other events that you can see in say this way this i think has to do with mem copy device to host this is basically once you are done with an inference or when you're copying the styles back to device you will see that on, on multiple such inference uh, cycles at the end you will have this pinkish or um, uh, or whatever color you see uh, as the device to hop device to host transfer of the inferred tile back to the device so these are also some of the points that one is looking at when uh, you're looking at uh, uh, the profile and the green ones are i think host to device copy if you hover your mouse, you can see this is this is host to device mem copy of how many bytes, how much time does it take? So all kind of inefficiencies in your code is something that you pick up from a profile like this, and you can tune your profile uh, according to the uh, according to the. It's basically it, it's an art uh, how you profile a, a system. So there are no ground rules. Okay, there is just one rule, let's say, how to profile an application, but one one needs to see and look at which particular area that he or she wants to focus on and improve upon uh, incrementally by looking at multiple versions of the code and improving upon some of these kernels that is being listed. Some of the kernels is in your hands, uh, let's say a CUDA kernel that you have implemented, but a CUDA kernel maybe which is sitting in CUDNN or uh, CUBLAS is something that is beyond your um beyond your 
let's say uh, you know development reach but, but then you can also look at it uh, you any... can also have that option to choose so in this specific case right so this theoretical occupancy if you see it's 25 percent now this 25 percent is actually telling you that one fourth of your gpu is being used and remaining 75 percent is sitting idle so there are alternatives to this kernel that is one option to choose appropriate kernel from the uh, from the CUDA and in library and the other option is that you can also write uh, uh, a kernel that would be uh, utilizing that uh, the hardware resources more efficiently you can actually pump up this uh, theoretical occupancy to say 70 percent or something like that yeah yeah so i mean this is something you take uh, a, probably a day's time to go through the entire end-to-end uh, -end performance analysis and optimizations and we try to give you a flavor of how things are being done when a performance architect looks at the, the uh, an application and then try to uh, drive performance out of it right so maybe i mean we have to kind of wrap up in a couple of minutes time yeah i mean the notebook and access still uh, i think it's it's there one hour post this uh, this tutorial so you are free to kind of play around i think the way we have uh, we had crafted it is is pretty elaborate to like really see uh, import uh, seismic uh, volumes see for yourself how these volumes look like how big these volumes are what's the size of a, a realistic volume like the volume that i uh, import here for just for showing purpose is is uh, 201 by 201 by 51 but this is not the volume that we play around on a daily basis and this is far from reality so the volumes that we play around uh, the medium size volumes are 2000 cube size volumes so you can think how big these volumes are and what are the different strategies you you have to uh, you have to apply while you increase the end to end performance of, of such a uh, workflow so I think yeah that's it uh, from my side. I'll hand it over to Subhashish to kind of uh, uh, pro provide some closing comments before we uh, before we wrap. Yeah. So I mean I think Anirudha, this will be open for them to download the Python uh, notebook. Yeah. 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 They, uh, okay. Yeah. You can just you can do SCP to your local uh, machine. So solved inference client you can just right click and download and you essentially you get the the whole notebook you can open it in your local jupyter notebook if you if you want and if you want to go go through it uh, at your own pace or google collab is one place where uh, probably uh, you can also have a look at there are some gpu instances which you can get free of cost uh, yeah but, yeah, that's one avenue where, which you can explore. And there are some open source data as well. Uh, so which I think we have already uh, given it into this uh, Jupyter notebook somewhere. Yeah, so Cords Comad uh, data sits here. There are three, two volumes that I had given. One volume, as you can see, is of 4.7 GB, which is a very big and a realistic volume. And the volume that uh, I had put here just for uh, demonstration and visualization purpose is of 17 MBs, which is uh, 201 by 201 by 51 size uh, 3D volume. Yes. I mean, just to conclude that, so we tried to give you a very high level overview of how uh, performance engineering is done, and particularly the domain where we have uh, complex systemic volume processing. Uh, inferences and this is also uh, being fed to the uh, larger pipeline of the entire workflow and also we take uh, uh, an, an, an intermittent steps to train the model in more accurate way and this entire process is uh, time consuming and at the same time it requires understanding of what is happening inside the systems the architecture the software and how they interact with each other. So if everything works fine, if the bottlenecks are addressed in, in a suitable way, you would get a better performance, which will help the business, which will help uh, inferring 
in a much faster uh, uh, i mean much faster time that the time to take a decision becomes uh, shorter and that helps the business even further so on this note i will conclude here and we will be happy to take any question if there is otherwise hand it over to the session chair yeah i think thanks thanks anirudha and team um i don't see any questions as such i think the questions have already been answered which has been in there in the q and a uh, if anyone else has questions please feel free to post them in the q and a box um and we'll be glad to pass it on to the team and our emails are there also with the participants so i mean we will be happy to answer if there is any question uh, regarding the the demo the the python notebook that we shared or any other things that we, we can help them understanding this better yeah so i don't see any further questions i think we can conclude this session thanks so much uh, saurabh suvashish anirudha for this uh, talk and i hope a lot of people got information about how to use or you know at least engineer performance in real world applications on huge data sets um yeah if there's any further things please feel free to reach to the authors directly thank you so much thanks yeah thanks everyone for joining bye thanks bye thank you